It's a real honor to be uh, able to, to welcome and introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake is, is one of the most um, clear thinking and revolutionary scientists of our time. He's now published uh, over 80 scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals, including Nature, uh, and 10 remarkable books, starting with, the, with that great breakthrough work, A New Science of Life, and then going on to uh, the uh, presence of the past and the rebirth of nature, and um, seven experiments that could change the world, and now Science Set Free which had the British title, The Science Delusion. Um, be interesting to hear Rupert talk about the shift in title from the, US to, from the UK to the US. Um, he was a fellow of Clare College uh, at Cambridge University and a research fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, and he's now a member of many scientific societies, uh, scient uh, such as the Sci Society for Experimental Biology, and uh, the Cambridge Philosophical Society. Many consider his theory of morphogenetic fields one of the most fruitful since uh, the origin of species, uh, one of the most fruitful for biology, certainly, but also for other fields, such as psychology. Um, James Hillman, um, another, another kindred spirit, has proposed what he calls an acorn theory for better understanding the, the, the narrative arcs of a human life. Uh, he says, just as the acorn holds implicit within itself the pattern for the, for the growth and the, and the uh, maturation of the oak tree, and it draws towards it what it needs in order to uh, actualize its potential, so, so also does the individual human being. Each of us, uh, from this point of view, is uh, shaped by a, by a unique um, individual energy, a, a daimon, as, as Hillman would call it, a, a calling that's expressed in, in many different ways throughout the lifetime, and it draws towards it those childhood experiences that are necessary for what is to come like Louis Armstrong happening to be given a trumpet as a New Orleans uh, waif um, uh, when he's a child. I think, um, and we see how this process gets more and more evident as the person actualizes what was potential and, and, and fulfills their, their life work. And I think we can see this process at work in, in Rupert Sheldrake's life from the start as he uh, surrounded himself when he was very young as a child with a host of animals like uh, from uh, caterpillars and tortoises to uh, pigeons uh, and his dog. And um, his father was an herbalist and uh, taught him botany and, and through his microscope showed him uh, the wonders of nature. And while still young, Rupert collected plants and read books on natural history. And even by the time he was 12, he knew he wanted to become a biologist. And then he went on to uh, Cambridge, um, where he studied uh, the sciences there, but then also then went on to study philosophy and history of science at Harvard. And now I think we can say uh, that Rupert is really one of the, the most uh, influential and, and splendidly controversial scientists of our time. He, he is a Socrates among the Athenians, uh, upsetting their unconscious dogmatic assumptions. He arouses their ire uh, precisely uh, because they uncomfortably sense that he is seeing something that they are not and that they haven't, and, and this destabilizes their certainties, and not only their specific certainties, but also their larger underlying frame of reference. And this is very, very, uh, very challenging. He suggests that their fixed earth might be moving, mm -hmm. uh, that their unchanging laws of nature might be ever-evolving habits. 
and over and over again in many areas of research, he suggests that there might indeed be more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in their materialist philosophy. He points out that the mechanistic perspective that continues to underlie the mainstream scientific worldview is secretly anthropomorphic. That term that modern science is most obsessively interested in removing from its cognition, and yet within the heart of, of its mechanistic perspective is hidden this anthropomorphic assumption for, as Rupert points out, there are in fact no machines in a state of nature. Um, all machines are human-made, just as is the metaphor imposed on nature by the mechanistic theory. May I say just one more thing before uh, giving the lectern over to Rupert? to place tonight's presentation in context. I think there's no, there's no more crucial task today for thoughtful individuals in our precarious civilization than to reach towards and, and then help disseminate a larger and deeper perspective to see our world and our place in it with new eyes and thus, and thus to transform our culture's worldview. In the course of the great modern development, a tremendous, a, tremendous play, a, a tremendous shift took place, particularly centered around the Enlightenment, that it, it moved from a civilization in which the center of gravity in defining our worldview was religion as the principal power that, sh that was affecting our cultural vision and, and the strategies that that moved our, our, uh, our way of life. And it moved in the course of the modern era to one in which science held that role. Science became, in a way, not only the, the, um, the most powerful force in shaping our, our, our cosmology, our worldview, but also it, it uh, became a new faith, in a way, a faith in modern reason that could shine its light on the world and, like the sun, illuminate everything, objectifying the cosmos, seeing it as an object, objectifying the earth and seeing it as an object, and thereby empowering the human subject all in one move. But this, this extraordinary confidence, this, this luminous, powerful confidence in, in modern reason, came with a shadow, as all light does. A shadow, in this case of hubris, of exaggerated assurance, of superior knowledge and certainty, a cutting off of sources of knowing that other cultures and other ages have developed and honored as necessary for any authentic engagement with reality. Our world today, which is so fraught with the consequences of modern civilization's reductionist assumptions deeply needs what Rupert Sheldrake has brought to the table of scientific discussion. The precision of his thought and articulation, the breadth of his expertise and his erudition, the calm equilibrium with which he engages what has surprisingly often been fierce hostility all these represent a model of intellectual excellence and courage for all of us. Rupert Sheldrake is perhaps as well suited as anyone living today by training, by sensibility, and by courage in battle to engage this crucial task. He is a Lancelot in our round table as we seek to recover the sacred mystery of our cosmos. Let us welcome him warmly to San Francisco. Well, thank you so much, Rick, for that generous introduction.